I too would like to pay my respects to uh, the Wurundjeri people and their leaders past and present. As Tim Pallas has already said, um, I'm not your classic orator. So I'm going to claim the title. I'm pretty keen to be an orator for the first time ever here tonight. Uh, that first time ever, don't let it put you off. Uh, not everything's better the second or third time around. Some people will have observed from that introduction that I'm an economist. And as you also know, economists, we like to prove our points by talking to data, showing people the effectiveness of information that's available. So fill your glasses. I'm, I'm just going to run through a few slides and uh, <laughs> there. And that's pretty obvious too. And I don't really have to explain that. And uh, so in conclusion, there it all is. I hope you feel better for that, and I certainly do too. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> My current position as Chairman of the Productivity Commission gives me the opportunity to engage with a wide variety of groups and individuals, uh, from the great and powerful to the unheralded, unrecognised quiet achievers. Fields are diverse, you heard from the introduction, quite astonishing. I, I really can't think of a job, public or private, that gives you that kind of opportunity. The Commission, we do these deep dives into social and economic issues. A month ago, we published on dying with dignity. This week, we're in the midst of a debate about the shares of the GST. Um, next week, it'll be superannuation. A month after that, we're finalising a report on competition in banking, uh, which we will hand to both the government and the Royal Commission. So the Commission's a unique institution. Uh, some state governments are now setting up productivity commissions and uh, that's all to the good, but we're a genuine outlier in developing public policy. And as you've heard, I'm in my sixth year. But important as this job is, it's not what defines my life in public policy. The bulk of my working life since the 1990s, the only constant has been infrastructure. I worked on the original national highway system, developed the first road safety black spots program, I worked in telecommunications, in interstate rail freight, but urban public transport, blah, 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 we can keep going. Down through uh, what I did in Victoria, desalination plant, and then up to Commonwealth with the NBN. These are the jobs I have worked on. And even when I was at ANSET, as you heard in the introduction, half of my week, the half that wasn't spent with regulators, was spent on airport infrastructure. Now the economics of infrastructure, not too hard to work out. Infrastructure is the platform on which societies and firms construct the future. A weak platform fails to support the weight of these efforts and societies and firms then suffer, opportunities are lost. Now those of us with a passion and interest, and that's this room in infrastructure, can and do argue incessantly about which projects are the next project that'll justify the huge bills that come with doing anything significant, particularly in urban environments. I'm not here tonight to nominate winners, someone else will be doing that shortly, so hold on, I'm not the winners person, but I'm going to reiterate that the process by which we do pick these projects remains poor relative to the significance they carry. We need persistently to make decisions and we need to make better ones due to the intellectual effort of public debate informed by publishing better information on the projects before we make the final decision to commit to them. And this is what helps make the platform stronger. I said better decisions, and for me, the better decision is, can be summed up as a process that determines, in advance of that announcement, the least risky path to delivery of a known and accepted public interest objective. These are long-term assets, and they're so risky in their early stages that private firms generally will not supply them, which inherently explains why governments are involved in so much of infrastructure. But the point then is, if they are that risky and governments are involved, then governments are going to be taking some risk. Now, I just mentioned the NBN, the project that almost dare not whisper its name, and around which I see media regularly failing to cite it when they talk about maybe the Snowy Two or one of the Connexes is Australia's largest infrastructure project. It is not, the NBN is Australia's largest infrastructure project. I worked on the NBN for four years, heading the communications department in Canberra. In that time, we were almost entirely focused on creating that least risky path to the public interest objective for a project that embodied every possible kind of risk and on steroids. So we also know, though, that governments and public servants, and I'm one, 
are generally deeply risk averse. So there's the conundrum. The most risk averse of parties, government, has to become the chief risk balancing party. And we have to solve that every time we commit to consider one of these really big things. That involves advising ministers on taking risks. A former senior colleague of mine once described advising ministers on their big risky infrastructure commitments as like swimming with sharks. You never know when one will turn around and take a bite out of you. <laughs> and in your case, he said to me, you seem to get way too much enjoyment from prodding them as they glide by. <laughs> now, my, I'm a nice guy. My former colleague was completely wrong. Tim Wright, I'm a nice guy. But my, Prodding sharks is inherently very dangerous and I've managed to survive 25 years doing infrastructure oriented jobs by not taking unnecessary risks. So yes, what my colleague had seen was right. I have called out bad decisions before they're made when I could identify them and I've designed work to ensure that the public interest objective is delivered first before we consider things, other objectives like say vote winning and m make sure that the public interest objective was not put in jeopardy. That's dangerous stuff. And to do that safely meant setting and holding on to some pretty high expectations of our own. In particular, I strongly have always emphasised to governments, if we say it, we need to mean it. In a world where the ability to call a spade, a multi-dimensional earth-moving device making a sustainable contribution to thousands of new jobs, is on constant display, the ability to speak plainly and argue a position consistently is of immense value to a weary public. So simple, clear communication really matters. And it matters not just externally, but it matters also between the parties, both contractor and public servant, and the leaders. Our audience is leaders who can change the nation for the better but they have plenty of other things to occupy their attention. It's very hard, I know, to take an example from my own past, to have a former stock and station agent readily understand the adverse implications of location-specific air traffic control pricing. It's very hard for a minister to pick up the nuances. It's important for that communication, not just outwardly to the public, but inwardly inside government to be simple and clear and open. Beyond simple, clear communication, we need more of a preparedness amongst the advisor class not to cut corners in order to get alignment between the public interest objective, the planning process and the implementation parties. Anyone who's worked on the kind of complex projects that make up serious infrastructure investments knows the important importance of this constant attention to alignment. Now that doesn't mean taking an interminable time to reach a decision, but inconsistency between the project planning agency, the project implementing entity, time and again seems to come back and bite us on the bum in major projects due to a lack of alignment between the parties and a potential for creating undetected shifting of risk. And third, we all like honesty and enthusiasm, but I see them as more than just nice human characteristics. Amongst our teams, all of us working on infrastructure, on all sides, they're essential. When you move, as I have, from rail projects to airport projects and water projects, you can't expect to be an expert in each. And so I say this, we can buy in competence and subject matter expertise, but I favour, above all in the members of the team, honesty and enthusiasm. Some of you will, you will know, he's in this room here tonight, I brought a Rhodes guy in to build our big desalination project in Victoria. He was brilliant. So I know you can buy in or develop subject matter expertise, but for the project decision makers, you can't buy honesty. It has to be inherent. And similarly, enthusiasm is very hard to generate after the event. Now, I'm grateful, as I said earlier, to be finally an orator, but I'm a bit worried about this because when Vince Graham did his oration a few years ago for this same organisation, I came over and I said to Vince, you know, it's only old people who do orations. <laughs> now, Vince gave me a particularly powerful slap on the back and rejected the idea, and I now see how clearly how right he was. 
Vince and I go back to the early 1990s when the Commonwealth Government started to take rail freight seriously. I worked, as you've heard in the introduction, in Bob Hawke's office then. Most of the things we worked on in, in transport and communications reform were successfully introduced, part of a series of packages of reforms, and I guess that explains in my current job my unchanging attachment to the idea that you integrate a set of reforms and you sell them strongly to the public as a way of achieving change. I haven't been very successful with that, I've got to admit, but it remains inherently in my head. Interstate freight reform was delivered in just this fashion. It has, and for a long time in Australia, had a, an ugly economic history. Going back to the 1970s, it was one of the failed dreams of the Whitlam government to take control of Australia's inconsistent rail gauges and deliver a national rail network and operator. So we, in the 1990s, working uh, for the Hawke and then Keating governments, without intending to deliver on that dream, but instead focusing on rescuing from near death a failing state asset, which was putting unnecessary pressure on road transport, we put together this plan for the states to surrender their rail freight businesses to the Commonwealth. You might remember the creation of National Rail. The Commonwealth offered to invest $350 million, a fortune then, but today apparently it buys you 2.9 kilometres of rail network from Port Botany. <laughs> Where are you, Tim? <laughs> The Commonwealth offered to invest $350 million in new rolling stock, terminal signalling and the like. And the states diddled around for a bit to see whether we'd make a better offer, but then they jumped on the idea like crazy, offloading perennial loss-making businesses to the Commonwealth and their workforces was a godsend to them. In an infrastructure sense, it was a bit of a nightmare. You know, be careful what you wish for. The states were supposed to nominate the assets to be transferred. So large swathes of poorly maintained regional rail network were of course included. A national rail, a new operator, could either accept the assets or reject them. At the time, it was considered utterly irrational to separate rail track from above rail operations, as they were described. Because despite their poor condition, no one in the federal government could seriously consider rejecting the network assets, since the states could then neuter any operational improvements we invested in by not maintaining the track or altering train priorities, as they often already did. Now, Vince had been hired as National Rail CEO and he told me in a typically straight speaking session how utterly irrational I was for even thinking of the idea of separating track from train. And his executives, concerned for my mental health, sent me books, there are books on this subject, would you believe it, on the lessons of the intrinsic linkage between track and train. <laughs> of course, a couple of years later after we did this in Australia, Deutsche Bahn did it for Europe, so, you know, but we were pioneers then. A bit like the guy who remade baseball by using data to pick the value for money players, my answer to Vince was based just on the money. I said to him, how are you going to maintain and upgrade a rail network stretching from outside Brisbane to 100 or so kilometres short of Perth with the remainder of your $350 million now fast disappearing on the sexiest new rail wagons and terminals? So I'm not claiming to be the sole owner here of the idea that became the ARTC. Success has a thousand fathers and failure is a lonely orphan. A lonely bastard for those of you who don't. The text says orphan, it's orphan. <laughs> but there was a time when me and two other guys, Leon Wellsby at Australian National and Rod Bullock at Booz Hamilton, were pretty lonely people. We had to convince not just Vince and his board, but also the Federal Treasury to fund the capital investment in new rail track infrastructure, just as we do with roads. Now, this parallel with road investment was absolutely crucial to convincing us a sceptical Treasury. And we even improved on the road model by seeking out and contracting new private and public rail operators and we charged them per train path. At the minimum we recovered the maintenance cost at least of each track section. Sometimes we got a bit of capital contribution. We created rail access pricing. I mentioned this piece of long ago history tonight for two reasons. It represents the kind of policy leadership that we don't see much of today. While a Labor government initiated these ideas, a coalition government, far from rubbishing them, built them up to a sophisticated business enterprise. And second, because it leads me well into the greatest failure of my time in infrastructure. And we always learn more from failure than success, as long as we survive. My greatest failure is the lack of a comprehensive approach to road pricing. Now, I know your past chief executive, Brendan Lyon, Brendan's down here, he's gone on to bigger and better things. But I thought I'd mention something uh, in relation to Brendan which shows you how much road pricing has been at the forefront of my thinking 
From the 1990s and even into this job, a couple of years ago, Brendan asked me to talk to a conference of water infrastructure people. And I looked down the list of luminaries speaking and I thought, I've got nothing to say that they can't cover. And at the same time, we're engaged in Canberra in a bit of a debate about whether it would be wise for the new Federal Roads Minister to open up a debate on road pricing. So I delivered a speech, you can still find a copy of it, it's on our website, I'm sure IPA has it, on what road policy can learn from water policy. There was a bit of a tangential link to Brendan's conference theme. But just to make sure people didn't think they wandered into the wrong conference, I did mark up the speech to indicate where I was going to move into full bore mode, road pricing, so the water people could go out and get a cup of coffee. <laughs> but if there's water here, people here tonight, no such luck. For me, road pricing dates back to that time I was working in Hawke's office. We did some heavy vehicle road reforms, we got some uh, significant changes in both road safety and registration, but we didn't get far in pricing. 25 years on, there's still just a notional portion of fuel excise designated as a proxy road charge for heavy vehicles, and there's nothing at all for light vehicles. In all other areas of nationally significant infrastructure, there is some form of user charging. The idea that price should affect allocation of future investment is novel in roads, even as it is common as muck in water and energy and airports and telecommunications or ports. So when you say user pays, and eyes roll at some of the regulators' decisions, but the bottom line is, you know what's meant and how it happens, and mostly it works. Because of effective pricing, stuff gets built most often where and when people are prepared to pay for it in infrastructure. But the current lack of effective pricing for roads probably best explained by the lack of a good crisis. If all else fails, you can generally be sure that better policy will eventually be applied as a consequence of that. And my suggestion is there is a crisis near to hand. Now, I'm not endorsing the idea that we should welcome a crisis, it would always be better to make policy change in advance of distorting the investment seam with a horrid shock. But I suggest the comfort that Commonwealth and State Treasuries have at present, that what we spend on roads is generally covered by a road tax paid somewhere by someone, is disappearing quite fast. This slide, a serious slide, shows that back 10 years ago, we used to earn about 2% of GDP in revenue relating to roads, from fuel excises, and motor vehicle registration, and because this was done by the Productivity Commission, it includes a share of stamp duty and just about everything on motor vehicle sales that we could imagine could be put into a big bucket and called road funding. And you can see those red lines fall as a percentage of GDP throughout that period. About 2% of GDP is now to down just above 1.5% of GDP, and you can notice that even though the spending on roads, the blue line, moves around a bit, the bottom line is it's, it's rising and the net number is that little green bit. So, and, and that net number is 2015-16. I'm told 16-17 is a bit worse. So there's the coming crisis. We are not from the sources that we claim that we are going to gain our roads revenue from. We are not getting it. And the pressure is coming from a set of changes. Some will be bigger than we imagine, some will be smaller, but here they are. Electric vehicles. Tesla took in 400 million US dollars in $1,000 deposits for its new Model 3 last year. $400 million in $1,000 chunks. That's 400,000 people who lined up to get a Tesla. That includes Australians, but around the world. Every major vehicle manufacturer around the world, including heavy trucks, is planning a widespread use of hybrid engines. Higher fuel efficiency standards are being mandated in foreign markets from where we will receive in future all our cars and trucks. And Amazon-style home delivery services are reducing the need for multiple trips to shopping malls. Some of these will be bigger, some will be smaller, but the bottom line is fuel excise is going to go down significantly. So we will, I suggest, in the 2020s, need a new source of road charging, lest all of the owners of fossil fuel guzzlers end up subsidising all the hybrid and fully electric drivers. Now, there are a few hesitant signs that the Commonwealth Government might be looking more closely at the coming e-vehicle revolution. Both Infrastructure Australia and Infrastructure Partners Australia have drawn attention to an opportunity to perhaps embed a road user charge in some e-vehicles, given that they'll pay no fuel excise. But in my view, these kind of revenue raising measures on their own won't see us through. Governments can and will undoubtedly do a little bit more to defer the fiscal impacts. They'll have more toll concessions probably, they'll have more availability payment type schemes. 
And for a short time, they'll probably look less dangerous than moving to road pricing, but inevitably, we will go there. And more importantly, toll concessions and the like can only deal with new infrastructure under the constraints we currently mentally place upon ourselves. And we will need to make that mental shift from paying only for new roads via those methods to paying for a mix of older roads and newer roads and related projects. Because the misallocation of resources that will occur if we don't will skew our future road funding towards investments that can be turned into concessions. And those are particular kinds of roads. They are not the roads that will benefit the bulk of people. And more important than that, from my position, that not all that efficient is a way of investing. You can then think from a social policy perspective, the feeling amongst outer urban commuters having to pay for their new roads while inner urban residents with newer cars don't isn't going to help bigger arguments that may emerge roughly in that same frame, time frame in the 2020s of big social trends like income inequality. And finally, we should recall for a moment what we can learn from user pays in all other major infrastructure. That is, if we have no market-based linkage between what an individual chooses to pay for and what projects are subsequently funded, we will misconstrue the true role of price in a market economy. To be accepted by commuters, even if grudgingly, price has to be about consumers driving suppliers, not the other way around. This is the sort of thing that electricity transmission and di distribution has recently got so badly wrong. There are those too who will argue a different argument. They will say, let it all remain free. Let's just ensure that general tax revenues pay for more of what we need. Here in Melbourne, we have a natural experiment going on with free road transport. The trams are free in the CBD, which means on wet nights, those wanting, to get home, uh, those wanting to go just one or two stops up Collins or Burke Street, pack into the trams and keep out those who need to get on in order to go home. This includes me, I might say, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so when road use is free, demand keeps piling in, is my point. Free's not all it's cracked up to be. Now, curiously, the first step to doing road pricing properly is actually not to start setting prices. No consumer, no heavy vehicle operator can have any confidence in suddenly having to pay for a road that yesterday was apparently free. You can guess the first steps if you go back to what I said in the opening address. First, identify the public interest objective and be open about it. Communicate effectively using language that's clear. In this case, that we have to pay for what we need and we aren't doing that anymore. And then establish a structure that aligns the funds raised both today and in future from road use with a selection of projects to be funded in the future. There's a very good Productivity Commission guide on how to do this. I had something to do with preparing it. Excellent piece of work, pat myself on the back. Published in 2014 and we updated it last year and published again in 2017. And third, you've got to involve credible third parties in establishing in con consumers' minds this linkage between what they pay and the projects selected. And fortunately, we have such groups available readily to us. They're called the RACV and its equivalents around the country. We should involve them more effectively in project selection. The biggest gains of this kind of reform do not lie in simply getting more revenue. That's just a catalyst. The true public interest objective is a system that selects the right projects where, as in other forms of infrastructure, people have a choice and show they're prepared to pay for it. Now, we can surely sell that simple message. I was also thinking of talking tonight about airports and water projects and telco, as you know, but not much, you'll be relieved to know. Some of the most enjoyable work I've ever done was in those fields, and like the ARTC, the policy models that I worked on then, I look around now, you know, I'm getting old, I'll soon be out of this gig. They're still working pretty well today, 20 or more years on in some cases. There are critics of our airport prices, price monitoring process. There are critics of the size of the availability payments for desalination or how much optical fibre really is needed to future-proof a digital network against capacity chokes. But from the bigger picture perspective, the public interest is generally being served in those forms of infrastructure. So we can always do better by not changing plans simply because the government changes, by always doing the assessment and planning work up front and openly before the announcement is made rather than after it. And there are newish bodies to help do this. Infrastructure Australia and its New South Wales and Victorian counterparts have settled into, I think, quite useful roles. 
The real limits on what we can do to improve our total infrastructure platform for a nation are now mostly created by our unwillingness to double down on what we know works. That prices and infrastructure allow for user choice for the most part, and thoughtful governments will manage risks where these are too big for any single firm or indeed for the general public to bear. By comparison, populist subsidies, complex committees of management structures and slogans as substitute for decisions are a terrible burden to place on investments whose size is measured in points of GDP and lasts for 50 or more years. Thank you very much.